Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash and this is video number two in the Better Sweater series. Now the series is meant to accompany our remake along in 2018, but it's also meant to stand alone as a kind of design workshop uh, where we talk about garments, garment construction, and how we can make better sweaters. So welcome, it's lovely to see you here. Uh, in case you're out of context, the uh, remake along for 2018 uh, has everything to do with going to our closets, finding sweaters that we love from big box stores or our grandmothers or sweaters that we've uh, picked up from a, maybe a, a consignment shop or something like that. And there's something not quite right about them, so you want to remake them and change a little bit about the design, remake them in a new kind of wool or yarn uh, fiber or something like that. Um, and in our last episode, uh, we talked uh, about sweater evaluation. So taking those sweaters, I had a big pile of sweaters, uh, and we talked about how to tell if your sweater is a good candidate for a, a remake, how to tell if it's a good candidate for your skill level, um, for the kinds of work that you'd want to do, uh, and to think about its basic construction. So we turned some garments inside out and kind of looked at how they were made. Um, and in this installment of the series, we are going to talk about two main things. The first are design considerations for you as you're getting into uh, remaking your sweater. And the second is yarn choice. So the idea here is that after this episode, you could go out and your homework would be to figure out what kind of yarn you wanna use and to start sketching out the design that you're gonna use for your sweater. I wanna say a huge thank you to everyone who commented and responded and supported the first video installment in this series. Uh, I really just can't tell you how overwhelmingly wonderful it was to hear from you all um, and hear that this sweater series was uh, maybe something that you were looking forward to or you needed in your life. Uh, and I'm hoping to keep it up here and um, provide as much good information as I possibly can. Uh, so please keep your comments coming, keep your questions coming, and we'll get right into video number two now. So design considerations. Um, there are a bunch of things to think about and, and last time we, we covered a few of them but there are some basic places on a sweater where you can make um, choices about what you like and what you'd want to see. And you can do this with a pattern that you pick up as well as you know working from a sweater that you have in your closet or just working you know when you're designing a sweater just out of your head right all of these things are things that can change um, so neckline we talked about this last time there are so many different kinds of necklines that's one of the big features that you could change about your sweater um, and that includes v-necks and henleys and boat necks and all kinds of funnel necks all kinds of different ways you can do that um, we talked about sleeve construction as another area that can be changed around in a sweater depending on what else is going on, uh, whether or not your sleeves are set in or they're raglan, um, whether you're going for a drop sleeve, there's, there are a lot of options there too. Um, there's of course cardigan pullover. There's uh, construction in terms of are you working from the bottom up or are you working from the top down. Uh, there's things like color work and steaking to consider. Uh, what silhouette you're going for. Are you going for more of an A-line silhouette that kind of expands downward? Are you going for an hourglass silhouette, something more boxy? Um, what fits your body type? All those kinds of things. Um, so once you start thinking about all those different elements of your sweater, then uh, you can take the sweater that you're gonna work on and remake and decide if you like what you see or if those are some of the places that you wanna change things around. Um, now, there are a couple tools that you might consider using for rethinking a sweater. That there is such a thing as knitting graph paper. <laughs> and I know it might sound a little bit wild, but regular graph paper, because I have some right here, um, it has squares as its foundation there, right? Little squares. But the problem is knitting um, doesn't work. Knitting stitches aren't squares. They're more like rectangles. And so if you uh, go online, I'll put some resources, some links down um, in the notes here. Uh, you can find PDFs of knitting graph paper. And this is what it looks like. And the main thing about this graph paper is that it's little rectangles instead of squares. And so these better um, mirror the way that knit stitches can be uh, a little bit longer or wider than they are long, depending on how your tension is and what your gauge is, all that kind of stuff. Um, and on this particular website, this is from the knittingsite.com, you can get uh, knitting graph paper in 
a 2x3 ratio or a 4x5 kind of ratio. And this is the 4x5 ratio, which is pretty close to what a lot of you would probably be working on. And so you can sketch out your designs on this knitting graph paper and get a more realistic idea of how a sleeve cap might work out and actually look in knit stitches. So I'd highly recommend the knitting graph paper as you're kind of starting to design away and figure things out. Um, and the knitting graph paper, I'd, I'd say one of the cool things to do would be to take, um, and probably not the whole sweater at once, but if you use this for more like a sleeve cap or a neckline, you can actually see how the, um, the stitches would work out and look um, in your more finished knitted garment. So it's really, really useful um, quick tip for um, when you're working on your design. Okay, the last thing I want to mention are stitch dictionaries. So there are tons of stitch, stitch dictionaries out there. There have been some really neat um, color work ones that have come out lately. Uh, this is one of the kind of original older ones. This is Barbara Walker's A Treasury of Knitting Patterns. And I think she has, I want to say she has four of these out. Um, and I picked this one up at an estate sale for about a dollar. Uh, you can't always do that, but if you keep your eyes open, you can, <laughs> you can get some good deals. She has uh, color work in here, slip stitch, cables, lace, uh, twisted stitches, textured st stitches, and these stitch dictionaries um, can help you get started on the other design element that you want to be thinking about, which is, are you going to keep the texture of your sweater? Are you going to keep it the same, the color work, whatever it is that's on your sweater, are you going to use that? Um, in my case, you guys will remember, I'm working on this lovely cably pullover. And for me, I wanted to just double check some of these stitch patterns that I have so that I could have them charted out um, a little bit more easily for myself. And so there are books like Cable Left and Cable Right. And this one's by Judith Durant. And it is a great resource for finding whatever it is that's on your sweater. So I found one of my cables here, which means that I have a chart for it. And I found another chart for the larger cable pattern in the sweater. So I'll be using those charts and that is gonna be one way that I can figure out how many stitches and how wide things might be um, and how to use um, the stitches that I want to appear in my sweater. Now, if I wanted to change my cables, there are some great books like the Knitting Cable Sourcebook by Nora Gon. And I've talked about this on the uh, podcast before. Stitch dictionaries like this give you so many different ideas about different kinds of patterns that you could incorporate into your knitting and they give you the charts to do it. Um, and there are books just like this for color work, for other textured stitches, for lace, um, all kinds of different things. Um, and I have one here, this is the this is the Knitting Bible, um, which is a kind of, I've seen this in my library before. It's a pretty nice kind of lightweight book, um, but it includes lots and lots of different kinds of stitches and the charts that go along with them. So if you wanted to switch out um, some of the texture on your sweater, some of the panels, some of the, you wanna add a little something to the cuffs, you know, you're thinking about dolling it up a little bit. Maybe you just have a plain pullover that you're gonna work on, but you wanna add some detailing to the upper part, to the yoke kind of, or to the sleeves or to the hem. Those stitch dictionaries are great resources for kind of getting that, just that little bit of something. Um, the sweater I'm wearing is the Alias sweater by um, Isabel Kramer. And I love these little details that she's added to the cuffs here. It's a faux cable pattern, and it's something that runs throughout the sweater. It runs here, and down on the hem. And I just think those are nice little details. And so if I were to be remaking a sweater, I, and it wasn't a cable-y cable wonder, uh, I'd be thinking a lot about how to add in some texture and how to um, add some of those little details that kind of make it unique, right? So those are all a, a lot of like book resources um, for helping get your imagination going, kind of helping getting your creative juices going, and you have that graph paper so that when you actually want to start sketching things out, you have a good resource for doing that in a way that will look like knit stitches as opposed to just weird squares on graph. So the second part of this, you know, aside from kind of just being imaginative, thinking about the parts of the sweater that you would 
or could easily modify. The other part of this is thinking about kind of the more practical side of things. So if, for example, you have a sweater that has um, panels of cables or color work uh, and you're going to remake it, one of the things you want to think about is how those panels are going to reappear if you use a yarn that's of a different gauge, right? Um, or you make your sweater a different size. Like say you have a sweater that you love that's too small for you and you're going to make it bigger. Um, if you have panels of cable repeats in the front, and I'll show you this one for example. This is the Denali Pullover by Nora Gone, which I just finished for my husband a couple, maybe about a month ago. And you can see it has these massive cables all over the front and all over the back. And it's a seamed sweater, so I knit it in pieces and then seamed it all together. But one of the things I had to do with this sweater um, was to modify the cables a little bit because I was knitting with a yarn that was a different, that gave me a different gauge, different weight yarn gave me a different gauge, so I had to change the pattern up a lot. Um, but what I wanted to preserve in this sweater was the five repeats of the cables along the front, right? So you can see there's one here, one here, middle, and that, and so you've got three of these and two of these, and they're kind of nicely symmetrical. Um, so to preserve that, there are a couple things you can do. There are panels of reverse stockinette in between each of the cable panels that you can see there. There's also a stockinette running down the side of the sweater here. So instead of really mucking around with the nice symmetry of the cables, I kept my five cable repeats, but I changed, I ended up changing this stockinette portion and making it smaller to allow more room for these wider cables. Um, so that's one option is to kind of find a place, find some stockinette that allows you to make kinds of adjustments like that. With a sweater like this, where you can see it has a panel on either side of the cardigan front, and then I think you can see it there, it has a nice lace panel down the back, you can do a similar kind of a thing. Uh, you can keep this beautiful cable if you're going to make a larger size, and you can expand the uh, stockinette portion on either side of the cable. And that gives you a little bit of room to play with. So where this can get tricky is um, when you do have those cable panels or color work that's running right up to the kind of armhole of your sweater. Um, and Jenna, Jenna Wilson, who I mentioned before, she has some great articles on knitty.com about this, um, talks a little bit about some of the possibilities of moving cables around and creating different kinds of spaces, different kinds of stockinette and reverse stockinette sections that allow you to then modify the kind of width of your cable sections. So that's a consideration, um, especially for those of you working on textured knitting. Um, same goes for lace. If you need to do a lace repeat, uh, and this is more of a lace kind of mix of lace and cables. Um, if you need to do a lace repeat and you want to figure out how to place it on the sweater, remember that these plain kind of stockinette portions or the stockinette that's in between uh, your lace pattern can be your friend because those are the places that you can adjust to make things wider or more narrow. Uh, another consideration uh, for color work, and I'll pull this guy out, this is my Eba pullover. Uh, considerations for color work include how you want your edges to be finished and in this case, I knit the entire sweater body in a tube and then steaked open the armholes. But some sweaters have continuous yokes all the way around and you want to figure out, um, that makes it really kind of difficult to resize um, because you have this kind of color work pattern. Now if you're not a too much of a stickler about it and you don't really mind if your back and front are exactly the same, um, or you just want to resize in a certain kind of way, you could take out some of this color work but you'd have to be kind of strategic because you wouldn't want to take out, you know, a little piece of the X here, right? So it gets a little tricky with color work just like with cables, maybe more so because if you have a pattern that you really like and you want it to be continuous, you got to think about where to um, modify. And it might mean that um, you work in a different kind of gauge or you pick uh, a, p a different kind of color work pattern. And there are tons of stitch dictionaries for that kind of thing. Uh, a different kind of color work pattern that allows you to resize a little bit more easily. Um, other things to think about, especially if you're working on big box store sweaters, um, and this is something that um, Maggie Rigetti talks about in her Knitting in Plain English, uh, is 
a lot of these big box store sweaters are machine knit, right? And we explored that last time when we kind of turned our sweaters inside out and looked at all of those seams, right? Um, machine knitting is potentially, unless you are, unless you are a machine, uh, more regular. It's going to produce more regular fabric than most hand knitters can produce. Um, I'm a pretty, I have pretty good tension, I think. But even in like this yarn, for example, you can see a little bit of variation, right, in the tension, just a little. But it's enough to kind of distinguish hand knits from, say, machine knit garments. And if you're going to work up a machine knit garment into a hand knit garment, you might want to avoid things like revert huge panels of reverse stockinette, which is what the back of this sweater is made up of. Um, in part because when many of us purl, our purling tension is not as exactly the same or as good as our knitting tension. Now on a machine, <laughs> and it's, that's not necessarily the case, a machine can produce acres and acres of reverse stockinette and it can look all pretty uniform. But if I were to recreate this back, it might have a little bit of tension issue. Now, I also know that that's something I want to change about my sweater. I don't want to do the reverse stockinette back, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and I'm, Maggie Rigetti's given me one more reason not to do that, <laughs> I suppose. Um, the other thing to think about with machine knitting is that um, oftentimes machine knit sweaters are going to be knit in panels. So they'll have a front panel, back panel, sleeve panels, and as we saw when we turned our sweaters inside out, they're all seamed up. And those seams really do give your sweater a lot of stability. So if you're going to take a machine knit sweater that was likely pieced together, such as this guy, and you're going to make it uh, again, but you're thinking, well, I really like top-down sweaters, I really want seamless, I'm going to go for it. Remember that a seamless top-down sweater is going to have a different structural drape than a machine knit sweater that is knit in pieces and seamed together, because those seams really do help things hang from your shoulders. They help give it stability along the side so that your fabric doesn't just move out, you know? <laughs> that wasn't really a technical term, sorry about that. Um, but you gotta think about those kinds of differences once you switch from, uh, you're trying to go from this machine knit sweater to a hand knit sweater. Um, the other thing those seams do is they prevent certain kinds of stretching, depending on what yarn you're using. Um, not, they don't prevent stretching, but they help to hold the fabric together and preserve it a little bit differently. Um, so those are some things to think about. Um, other things to think about when you're um, redesigning your sweater and you're conceptualizing how you want it to look uh, are basic things like fit and proportion versus percentages. Um, so, and what I mean there is like, there are standard sizes and there are standard sizing, sizing charts. And that's often what um, machine knit sweaters are built around, are these sizing charts that assume an average body. Now we all know, if you've been knitting for any amount of time, that none of us have an average body. An average body is nobody's body. Um, and we all have different things about ourselves, wider shoulders, different waist sizes, um, different bust sizes, um, and all those kinds of things can affect um, the way that you uh, want to work on the proportions for your garment. If your body type is such that it's better to have a sweater hit you, you know, higher on the hip than lower on the hip, or uh, you need a little extra room in the bust, or your shoulders are wider like mine are, then those are all things you can adjust for if you're hand knitting a sweater. Um, but these machine knit sweaters aren't going to adjust for. And that may very well be the thing that you don't like about your machine knit sweater um, from a big box store is that it's knit for a standard average size as opposed to your size. So you gotta think about um, how you're gonna go about kind of personalizing it. And we'll talk about body measurements and sweater measurements in the next episode of this series. So hold, hold on for that one. So the second part of this video is about yarn choice, right? Um, and I know it might make for a slightly longer video, but for those of you who are working on your sweaters, I want to make sure we keep up the momentum and I give you enough information in this video to go out and get your yarn ready so that by the next time um, you watch the third video, you'll be ready to start measuring your sweater and swatching and talking, talking about actually getting to work on that, on that knitting project. Um, so yarn choice. There are plenty of excellent books out there about yarn. If you're not a spinner, um, I can do my best to give you a little bit of information about how what I know about yarn and how it functions. Um, if you're interested in reading more, there's tons of great books. Here's one 
This is Clara Park's uh, book, <laughs> I think it's called The Knitter's Book of Yarn, which really is apropos. And she spends a lot of time talking about plies and fiber choice and drape and everything else, and then she gives you lots of different patterns. So if you can get your hands on this from a local library, um, it's a really great resource. If you happen to be a spinner already and you're making your own yarn, you know a lot about yarn construction already and the ways that different kinds of yarn will affect um, or will act or affect um, the drape of a sweater, elasticity, all that kind of stuff. Um, you'll think about things like ply, um, halo, all those kinds of considerations. If you're a spinner, you're already thinking about. If you're not a spinner, here is a quick and dirty way to think about <laughs> yarn. So uh, there's, there is a way to figure out, if you're really curious, there's a way to figure out what yarn your sweater is made out of. It, it's called a burn test, and uh, I don't necessarily recommend it on if it's a sweater that you actually really care about very much. Um, but if, you're, if you have just yarn in your stash and you're wondering what it is, the burn test can help you understand um, what kind of yarn it might be, whether it's acrylic, wool, um, or cotton in particular. Um, because when you burn a little piece of that fiber or that yarn, uh, it will behave differently if it's an acrylic, like a plastic, uh, if it's a wool, and if it's a kind of cotton or plant-based fiber. And I'll put some links uh, in the show notes to about the burn test, so that if you wanted to go out and experiment with your stash, you could totally do that. Um, now, most of us aren't going to burn a bit of our sweater to try to figure out what it's made out of. Um, the other easy way, of course, is if you have tags still on the sweater, you can look and see what it's made of. Mine <laughs> is probably like most of yours, and I ripped the tag off, so yeah, not as helpful there. But I do know that this sweater, I do remember that this sweater that I'm going to be working on is part cotton and part acrylic. And that is also, you can kind of feel it in the way that it behaves and the drape of the fabric. Um, there's no wool here. It is definitely a cottony, acrylic-y sweater. Now, uh, there, it doesn't matter what your sweater is made out of. Remember, this is a remake along. So you can choose to remake your sweater in a lot of different yarns, with a lot of different fiber. Um, makeups. The choice is yours, but you've got to think about what are the some of the factors that will affect your final product. So, number one, you want to think about um, the drape of your sweater, like what you're hoping for. This sweater was made out of a superwash yarn, and I never made a sweater out of a superwash yarn except for this one, in part because Superwash yarn um, has the scales of the wool either glued down or ripped off, which means that it loses um, the ability to felt, right? So the wool can, the barbs of the wool can no longer stick to each other and felt, um, which makes for a much smoother yarn, soft. This is like a lot of um, superwash merino yarn, like sock yarn and things like that. Um, makes it so that you can throw it in the washing machine. Uh, but it also makes for a particular kind of drape. So you can probably see that this sweater right? And it's very um, soft, very loose, there's not a whole lot of elasticity to the whole thing, um, and it just, it really does drape on your body very differently. This sweater I'm wearing is made out of 100% wool, but it's made out of uh, mostly long wool, and long wool has less elasticity than, say, a merino. Uh, merino, if you look at the fiber, um, has lots and lots of little crimps to it, and those crimps help kind of keep the fiber coming back to the same shape. A long wool has much smoother, uh, maybe one or two crimps for a longer staple length, and so it produces a more drapey fabric, but not totally drapey. It does have the, the other properties of wool. This sweater is made out of 100% uh, wool, merino type wool, and you can see that it has crazy amounts of elasticity and memory. A completely different kind of drape. It's got a little bit more of a stiffness to it. And this guy, which I showed you before, is made out of 100% wool, more of the Faro Island kind of wool. And it is, it's definitely got some stiffness to it, some bulk. Uh, so this is a very different kind of sweater, <laughs> based on the yarn and the stitch and everything, than this guy, which is drapey and flowy and very kind of soft. And so your yarn choices um, do make a difference when it comes to what kind of final product you're going to have. Because it, and even if you make a swatch, 
that can give you some information, a lot of information about the yarn, um, but you think about a swatch of fabric, it's about this big. Once you make a longer sweater out of that, you get the weight of the sweater kind of pulling on that yarn, so the yarn will behave slightly differently than it may in the smaller gauge swatch. There's lots and lots of things to think about here. Um, the other, one of the other big things I like to think about now because I work on cables so often is ply. So when I think about wanting to create a garment that has a lot of texture to it, I want to have a yarn that has at least three plies. And that's because uh, a three ply yarn is a rounder yarn. Um, it is, you can see here, it produces this kind of roundness that you don't get with a two ply. And I don't have, I don't think I have a two ply lying around here, do I? Oh yes I do. So this is a two ply and it is not as round as the other yarn. Now two plies are excellent for lace work. They lay open, right? Uh, if you do lace work with a two ply, it just kind of falls open and it's, it, it just works beautifully. But for texture, for cables, you want to use at least a three ply. Um, at least that's how I have, <laughs> at least that's how I've come to think about yarn and texture. So the other thing to think about with ply is uh, single ply yarns may not be as good for sweater or garment knitting because um, of abrasion. So they don't have the other plies to kind of support them and back them up. And if one of these plies goes, well, the other two are still there. But with a single ply, if it goes, if it, it um, abrades or it has too much um, tension on it, it can snap and there's nothing there to hold the rest of the yarn together. So oftentimes people won't knit garments out of single ply yarns. That's not to say you can't. Um, in fact, the test knit that I'm working on right now out of a Donegal tweed, uh, which is a singles, uh, the, the singles is almost felted, and so it's a really strong, really excellent yarn for this particular sweater. Uh, so it all depends, I guess that's, that's really the answer. Uh, okay, so aside from design considerations with, in terms of ply and halo and drape, um, you want to also be thinking about, there are two really practical things to think about as you're remaking your sweaters. The first is probably like, what yarn do I use? How do I know what weight it is, right? How do I know what weight yarn this is so that I could replicate it or at least know where I'm starting from in terms of gauge? Um, and one simple test is to just sit, use your sweater as a big gauge swatch. So you take, uh, especially um, with a kind of simple stockinette sweater, which this isn't quite. Um, you, t you take a ruler and you measure a four inch section of your sweater and you look at how many stitches you're getting for that four inch section and how many rows you're getting for that four inch section. Just treat it like a big gauge swatch. And then that will give you a sense of gauge. And then you can look at most, um, most uh, yarns will tell you uh, a basic gauge, like this one, for example. Come on there, camera. There we go. I think it's working for you now. Uh, it tells you that the gauge is 20 stitches for every four inches and to use US eight needles. So a lot of yarns will actually give you a sense of the gauge. And if you're using your sweater as a big gauge swatch, then you have a sense of which yarn weight you're going for. The other practical thing to think about uh, for many of you is how much yarn do you need to remake your sweater, right? Um, there are a couple ways to go about this. The first might be, very simply, um, there are standards out there for sweaters, um, garment knitting, and Interweave Press has one of them, and I will post all this in the show notes, um, in the episode notes, but Interweave has a great chart up for kids, misses, you know, and these charts will tell you um, for a 32 to a 40 inch bust, for a regular comfortable pullover, in a fingering weight yarn, a sport weight yarn, a worsted weight, or a bulky yarn, how many yards you need. And that information is right here, All right? Again, I'll post this on the, on the notes for this episode. Um, so there are standard charts that kind of give you a ballpark figure if you're gonna make a pullover with a 36 inch bust, or you're gonna make a cardigan with a 40 inch bust, right? Um, so that's, that's a beginning point to kind of figure out how much yardage you need. Uh, another thing you could do would be to find a similar pattern to the one that you're going to be working on. So for me, I have this sweater that I showed you has the cable front and the kind of reverse stockinette back, uh, and it's a raglan. Well, I found this pattern on Ravelry, which is nothing but joy, which is very, very similar to the pattern I'm going to be working on. 
And the nice thing about finding a pattern like this on Ravelry is that, generally speaking, most designers will tell you the basic specs for a 32, 36, all the way up to 40, 42, maybe even larger sizes, um, and they'll give you a sense of how much yarn you need. So here, you can see, just in like the basic pattern specs, she'll tell you, for your basic size, how much yarn did you need. That's another kind of ballpark way to figure out how much yarn you might need for a sweater. Okay, so the third thing you can, third way to kind of figure out how much yarn you might need is again, use your sweater as a massive swatch <laughs> and as a, as a template basically. And you can kind of, this is from um, Jenna Wilson's, again, her nitty.com um, really awesome essays. You can kind of block out the basics of your knitting to get the surface area of what you've got going on there. So here she has a sleeve and the main body of the sweater and she's broken the body down into a, a square and a rectangle basically and the sleeve down into a rectangle and a triangle. And you do a little bit of math to figure out your um, area and then you can, um, when you knit up your gauge swatch in the yarn that you think you're using, uh, you could use the, how much yarn you use for the gauge swatch versus the uh, area that you create with your gauge swatch, and that'll give you another ballpark about how much yarn you might want to use for that sweater. There are plenty of other methods, and I'd love to hear in the comments what you guys do or what you might be thinking about doing to kind of guesstimate how much yarn you need um, for your sweaters, uh, but those are just three ideas that might get you started. Okay, so after all those, thinking about all those yarn considerations, um, I went about trying to find yarn for my sweater remake. Right. Um, this, as I said, is a kind of cottony acrylic version. I want to make it in a wool and I want to go with the raglan um, shaping, but I want to do regular stockinette back and keep some of the cabling that's going on in the front. Um, I looked at my uh, sweater as a big swatch and kind of determined, uh, I thought it might be a DK weight, but it looked more like a worsted weight to me. Did a little bit of that uh, swatch conversion and measuring and counting. Uh, and came away that it is a worsted weight yarn and I wanted to do a worsted weight yarn and I wanted to do something lighter to show off the cables. So these are some of my design considerations. Um, and I wanted to find something that was reasonably priced because a lot of yarn out there can be super expensive and I just, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of money on yet another sweater's worth of yarn. So I searched around online. Um, my other consideration is that I often want to use 100% wool that's um, got a good story to it, that it has some kind of, um, it's not just big box store yarn, it, it has a little bit of um, an interest to it. Now it's tricky to put all that together and find something that's cost effective. Um, what I found though is this Naturally Nazareth Worsted Weight Wool, which I'll show you here, and I found this, uh, the hip strings is uh, someone who's a company that sells this yarn. And I like hip strings. They do fiber and they do yarn. Um, they're funky people and I, uh, they have a podcast and they're fun to listen to. Uh, and they have this yarn, which is 100% American wool. And it is a three ply, which meets my requirement for uh, the textured knitting. And it's a light color um, that'll show off the cables really well. And believe it or not, this 200 yard skein, 100 grams of domestic merino was only, was less than $10. So that meant that when I did the math for how much yarn I needed for my sweater, I got six skeins of yarn, give me about 1200 yards, which should be just about right. And it was only about 60 bucks to buy the yarn for the sweater. A lot of times sweater yarn can cost upwards of $120, $150, um, depending on where you're going and what you're getting. But you can get affordably priced 100% uh, wool yarn for not too much. So I'd encourage you all to get out there, find the yarn that you want, and let me know, let us all know in the comments below if there are uh, yarns that you're thinking about, that you're trying to weigh your choices, and we'd love to, I'm sure a lot of us would love to weigh in and, and help you make your decision. So I want to say at the end of this video, <laughs> the second video in the series, uh, I want you guys to leave questions. We have a Ravelry thread open for um, thinking through all these design considerations and the remake along. Uh, and there are plenty of space for comments here below this episode. So please leave comments, leave questions, leave methods. Um, give us all tips and tricks that you've been working on and that have worked for you or that are working for you as you work toward this remake of a sweater. Uh, and 
Thank you so much for tuning in for video installment number two of the Better Sweater series. I will see you next time for video number three where we'll measure our sweaters, work on our gauge swatches, and just get started. So, see you soon. Thanks for coming by.